Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 157. Newlywed shooting budget, 5K for actors, 2K for insurance, 2K for food and drink, 9K in the can. We only shot for 12 days. Now that's how you make an independent film. Edward Burns. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Video Blocks. Now, if you guys are looking for stock footage, After Effects templates, motion graphics, Video Blocks is the site, man. I've been using them for years now. I use some clips of theirs in my movie, This Is Meg, for some stock footage. And this month alone, they're launching a new crazy collection of hundreds of new Unreal clips, including space, virtual reality, deep water, fantasy, and sci-fi footage. All of that comes free with your subscription, and it is a limited time. And you also get free 4K clips with your membership at no cost. And Videoblocks is now giving you seven days of free downloads. Download a ton of stuff for free. Check it out. See what's going on with it. And remember, whatever you download during those seven days is yours for free, royalty-free forever. So definitely give them a shot. So head over to videoblocks.com forward slash indie, I-N-D-I-E. That's videoblocks.com forward slash indie. Today's show is also sponsored by Digital Box Office. Now, Digital Box Office is a global provider of streaming movies, television, and all sorts of original content. DBO provides a dramatic new opportunity for indie filmmakers to gain previously unavailable global exposure and valuable analytics. Now, the service is going to be a data mine for Hollywood and for indie filmmakers as digital box office users are required to vote on the content that they watch on the platform via DBO's proprietary single one-click voting model. Now, you can submit your film today at upload.digitalboxoffice.tv and you can browse their current selection at www.digitalboxoffice.tv. You can also download the app for ISO or Android at the Google Play and Apple App Store. So guys, 360 video, a lot of people have been talking about it. A lot of people say it's going to take over. A lot of people say it's the future of what, uh, what everybody's going to be watching. And it's going to be, it's going to take over cinema and take over movies as we know it. Uh, I disagree wholeheartedly. I think it is another tool for storytelling in its own way. Same game, same way as video games are the same way video games are not taking over movies. Movies are movies. They will always be movies in one way, shape, or form. 360 video can tell certain types of stories, but not the kind of stories. You know, I don't see Martin Scorsese or David Fincher using 360 video to tell a story. It's an experience, and it's a ride in many ways, uh, and you can try to tell a good story, a narrative, without question, but it's not what we consider cinema, where a director is editing and telling you where to look in the scene as opposed to getting all the information at once and you got to go find the information. It's a different kind of storytelling. But I wanted to bring someone on the show who's an expert in the field, someone who really understands uh, 360, the technology, the ever-changing technology, how to actually make a living doing it, and so on. So I invited on the show Josh Gibson, uh, who is a a 360 video specialist. He's the founder of 360videoacademy.com and is uh, pretty much, you know, kind of knows what he's talking about when it comes to 360 video. So I wanted to bring him on the show so he can kind of explain it to us laymans on how you could do it, what the cost is to get into it, uh, and if you can even make money as doing it as a filmmaker. So I won't waste any more time. Let's get right into it. Enjoy my conversation with Josh Gibson from 360 Video Academy. I'd like to welcome to the show Josh Gibson, man. Thanks for coming on the show, man. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Alex. It's good to be here. I wanted you on the show because I am just dangerous. I just know enough to be dangerous in the 360 world. So I wanted to get a professional <laughs> to come on and and I'm going to I'm just going to beat you up with a lot of questions if that's okay. No, that's totally great. Shoot, I'm glad I'm excited for it. All right, cool, man. So, let's uh first and foremost, what the hell is 360 video for people who don't know? That's a, you know, that's a good question. It's kind of something that's been around for a while. 
Um, I mean, you look at like Google Street View, you look at, uh, you know, virtual tours on maybe some real estate sites. Like it's sort of this technology of, you know, the 360 degree panorama has been around for a while, um, but it's sort of been stuck in this the still world until, you know, a few years back when people started messing around with GoPros and, you know, trying to get smaller cameras and putting them all together so that they're shooting in all directions um, and trying to capture 360 degree video. Uh, so that's kind of where, you know, the explosion happened and when people started realizing Hey, you know, GoPro's not too expensive. Uh, you know, and this a lot of companies like Color and uh, you know other companies, including GoPro, um, started seeing a real future in this. And yeah, they started building software for it. And um, you know, and the rest is history. So it's basically putting a bunch of cameras together, shooting in every single direction, and syncing all those cameras up, and then stitching them together later on a computer. So it's kind of a process, but uh, you know, pretty simple. Simple, uh, you know, you're wrapping a sphere around a video and, uh, and, you know, that's how it works. Now, there, there's, I mean, from the points of GoPro rigs, now they're actually yeah. coming out with cameras that are built into a sphere. I saw some of them in uh, Cinegear last year. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and companies are coming out with those by themselves with their own proprietary software and things like that. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's actually really, yeah, exactly right. Um, so there's a few cameras that technically, I think... There's one that shoots 270 degrees and it's just one lens with one sensor. Mm -hmm. um, but as a matter of getting the full 360 degrees, you actually still technically need two cameras at least. Um, mm -hmm. And there's some like Kodak makes a couple of the SBK, um, you know, where you where you put two cameras back to back basically with super, you know, fisheye wide angle lenses on each one of those. Mm -hmm. um, so you basically have two, you know, half domes that you're getting and then you're just wrapping them together or that you're, you know, joining them together and aligning them. Um, but you know, yeah. But when you're doing with 360 though, I mean, uh, the kind of 360 that I've seen that looks good is somewhat distorted, but not completely distorted like a fisheye would be. Um, right. so that's good. I mean, that's what we're kind of going for, right? It's not like this kind of distorted fisheye. Cause if that's the point, then we're back in BC Beastie Boys videos back in the day. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that's kind of my opinion too. I think there's a, I mean, the Samsung gear is obviously another example of, you know, the two camera system and those are great and they work pretty well. Um, but the issue you run into with those two, two lens systems is obviously at the very edge of any fisheye lens, there's going to be distortion. Pixels are going to get stretched. So if you're going to be trying to stretch those back out to make them undistorted in a 360 degree, you know, viewing space, uh, you know, it's going to be a little bit blurry or you're going to see some, you know, aliasing or whatever, um, on those edges. So that's why people started moving into the, you know, multi-camera rigs where you have, you know, 10 GoPros, 20 GoPros, or, you know, any other small camera like the black magic, um, you know, camera that you can put on there. Mm -hmm. So people have been experimenting with all sorts of different setups, but obviously the other downside is when you add more cameras, you're going to uh, run into more stitching complications, um, you we'll know, with all the weird lines and stuff. We'll get into stitching later. Yes. <laughs> I that. have yeah, questions about one. stitching. <laughs> that one's fun. <laughs> Everyone's asking like, what the hell is stitching? I'm like, don't worry. Oh, we'll get, we'll get to it soon enough. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, so and the, the, a real basic question is: What's the difference between 360 and VR, virtual reality? Because they're kind of yeah. similar. Yeah, yeah, they are really similar, and they're used interchangeably a lot. That's a really great question. Um, so VR, you know, if we want to throw the the dictionary at it, is basically kind of like the video games that you see out there, where people are walking around in an actual 3D space. They have goggles on. It's usually hooked up to a really high powered PC or something, a computer, um, and they also have those little things they're holding in their hands where they can interact. Um, and you know, you see the cool video games where you're shooting zombies all around you or something. Uh, so that's VR, where you can interact completely with the environment you can walk you know with your actual two feet um and the goggles on your face are basically just you know re you know displaying what you're what you should be seeing in the video game or whatever so there aren't a lot of actual um vr video if you will but so and before i get into that sorry i'll, I'll talk about the difference mm -hmm. so 360 video on the other hand is basically captured video wrapped in a sphere around a user and the only thing that the user can actually interact with in the video is where they're looking, which direction they're looking in. Um, the filmmaker still has control basically over how tall that viewer is and where they are standing in that space. So with 360 video, 
you can look around, you can move your phone around if you're watching on a phone or a tablet or whatever, or on a, on a computer, you can click around and move, you know, your direction, but you can't actually walk, you know, anywhere. You can't say, Oh, what's that rock over there? I'm going to go see what's behind it. You can't do that quite yet with, um, with 360 video, but in a VR world, um, that's, it's all built on a computer. So everything is, you know, all the data is there. You could walk around and see what's behind the rock, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah, got it. So it's, uh, it, yeah, I actually saw that thing on Facebook once. I was, I was, I think I was watching um, Casey Nastat, yeah, uh, yeah. with with the Samsung rig, and he posted something on Facebook, and it said, "Move your phone left." I'm like, "What does that mean?" I'm like, "Oh my god!" I'm looking oh, yeah. through, saying, Jesus, this is this is witchcraft. It's insane. Yeah, it's really weird. It, it was yeah. the weirdest thing ever. Like, how did they know it was? And Facebook has, I guess, you could do it on. You could upload 360 video on Facebook now, and yeah. I was like, "Wow, that's." insane like just the okay. things you can do with that are amazing which brings me to my next question what kind of stories can you tell with 360 video can you can you shoot a feature film with 360 oh that's yeah that's the million dollar question um i there's been a lot of really cool experimentation going on um so i think the big question right now at least in my mind is you know what future does 360 video have with like documentary filmmaking versus mm -hmm. like narrative uh fiction filmmaking right so there have been a lot of like uh horror the the horror genre has been obviously all over 360 because you know you have all this new space to work with to jump and scare people um and i've seen a lot of recreations like historical recreations um in 360 video and I, you know of course that's my background is in documentary filmmaking so that's kind of where i've been working mostly um, but yeah, the, the, the short answer is everybody's doing, doing 360 and there have been full length feature films made in it. Um, there there's has, a can yeah, there's been, can you name some? Um, I actually don't know the name off the top of my head. It's, it's been pretty recent, but there have been a few like TV networks and stuff that have thrown, you know, pretty big chunks of money at VR and 360. And, uh, there's a lot of experimentation going on with it right now. So I think it's, it's been living a lot in the documentary world. Um, and I can look up some of these and give you uh, links and stuff and you can throw them in the show notes, but, sure. um, it's been living a lot in the documentary world. Um, but I think a lot of fiction filmmakers and, you know, like horror and stuff like that have been really interested in doing it. Um, but another kind of unforeseen huge genre of 360 filmmaking is the education world. Mm -hmm. um, there have been a lot of universities, uh, especially at the most recent NAB when I was out there. Um, you know, I met up with a lot of, you know, professors and administrators, education people that were from all over the country, all over the world, wanting to implement VR and 360 into their teaching, which is awesome um, because, uh, you know, obviously you can take people people out on a field trip, a virtual field trip of anywhere you want, uh, whether that be Mars or um, just a canyon up the street of the school, uh, you know, and, and then as a matter of fact, that's a project I'm working on now with a local university here is um, their geology department is is hiring me to do some work with them to uh, basically do some drone footage and some really cool like virtual um, walkthroughs of this canyon, this really interesting canyon nearby uh, so that's, that they can show their students. That's insane. So yeah, like he's like, it's like basically like, okay, let's go to the pyramids of Giza and you yeah, know, you yeah. can go to the pyramids of Giza or the Great Wall of China or any of these places. Right. And you can overlay graphics and put really cool, you know, you know, text or you, you could even throw, you know, 3D animated uh, time lapses if you want uh, saying like, hey, this is what it looked like 10,000 years ago. Now let's jump to today. Stop you know? it. Stop yeah, so it. People can just be standing in the middle of this really cool experience, right? So it's awesome. And then the cool part is people can watch it on their phones now. They can watch it on their tablets. They can do it anywhere. So you don't now, need to go to some fancy, uh, you know, planetarium or anything. It's, it's very accessible. So unlike VR, you don't need a helmet or a pair of goggles to look at 360 video, as long as you have it on, on a, it's being projected in a proper way. Correct. Like uh -huh. on YouTube yeah. Or so, right. You can technically, yeah, you can watch it on a computer, um, just on a laptop or, you know, whatever, and click around with the mouse, or you can watch it with, you can hold your phone out in front of you, your tablet. Um, obviously the, the most ideal way to watch VR or 360 is through goggles. It's a little sure. bit more immersive that way, you know, mm -hmm. with some headphones on and stuff. And, you know, there's spatial audio, which interacts, the audio actually can track to your head too. So there's, that's a whole other topic as well. Um, yeah. I was so going to say audio mixing for this must be it. A bitch. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's complex, man. It's, uh, you know, I'm not an audio engineer by any stretch of the imagination, so I can't speak to the, you know, nitty gritty too much, but it's, it's, they're, they're making it more simple. Um, I've been messing around in beta testing for a few companies, um, some software that basically allows you to mix the audio in like, you know, Adobe surround sort of format, you know, five, one, seven, one. And then basically what happens is you tell the can or you tell the, the, the software, where is your like your point one, you know, your your base point. And then as soon as your head turns, the software in either the phone Stop or the goggles it. has to actually process and change and mix that audio on the spot See, in real time. Come on. So yeah, it's so the yeah, it's pretty that's pretty insane. wild. That's insanity, man. I mean, we're tar- we're starting to get into Star Trek world, man. I'm, I, I, it's crazy. It's star- <laughs> we're we're just we're only a few steps away from the from the um the holodeck. We're, we're, oh, I know. Yeah. And then maybe the next thing is being able to create hamburgers from the, you know, the little touch screen, right? Oh <laughs> God, right? Imagine it's like and it's just there. Right, right. <laughs> Did you by the way, I hope the audience enjoy, enjoyed my sound effects. Um, oh okay. <laughs> I know so, I did. I appreciate it. So so now that let's say we're gonna go out uh, and shoot some stuff. Uh what's some pre shoot equipment that you would need to just do a basic three sixty shoot? So yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the, with the thing with 360 cameras, um, you you can go as small as like the Samsung Gear, um, or you know, Kodak has got the, one of those dual camera setups too, where it's got the two cameras back to back. But really, with 360 video, I mean, you could go all the way up to the Ozo to the Nokia Ozo. That's like a forty five thousand dollar camera. Um, you know, that's completely professional, global shutter. You know, thirteen stops of dynamic range kind of thing. Um, so that one's great. But uh, with 360 video, um, you can go you know as small as you really want. Uh, you know, and it's it's kind of threatening and it feels a little bit scary to go out and shoot it. But um, as long as you're holding your arm steady and or if you're on a tripod and you're just shooting like landscape stuff, you know, pre shoot equipment, all you really need is you know the camera and and kind of a sense of imagination. Really, and do you rec- you uh, how do you record the audio? So the audio can usually be recorded on the actual device. Uh, the Samsung Gear has a few microphones, and the Kodak does as well. Um, there actually are even a few. Uh, it's, I think it's called the Insta360. It's a company from I'm not even sure where they're from, but they have a cool little, basically small 360 camera that you can plug into the bottom of your phone, either Android or iOS, uh, and you can live stream 360 video now on Facebook or YouTube. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I'm sure vloggers and stuff are going to be, you know, all over this and wanting to get into that. So that's kind of fun. You can be, you know, taking people on a tour and stuff of, you know, if you're vacationing or, you know, talking to the camera, they can look at you or they can look behind you. Or, or if you you're know. on a film set and you want to give the people a tour of the film set, that would be a great marketing for everybody oh, yeah. listening. Totally uh, awesome. That would blow people's mind as far as great content and great material that you can use for marketing. I yep. mean, imagine just doing a 360 table read. Oh know, yeah, of of It'd all the great. actors. I mean, you could do my my not my marketing mind's turning on now. So, yeah. uh, that would be. Well, I'm sure they're going to implement it with Skype and with any other. You know, I'm sure it's going to be a business solution here pretty soon. Where if you want to beam into a meeting or something, you know, across the country or across the the globe, you can just sit there and it'll be like you're actually sitting there. You can look around, see who's talking. It won't be like a you know, a webcam that they set up in the corner trying to, you know, see everybody. It'll just be a 360 camera sitting in a chair somewhere. And, uh, you know, the CEO or whoever can sit there and look around and chat and like it'll the, be, like it'll the, be pretty cool. Like the Jedi council. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal. That's, That's the, goal. the goal. Jedi council. <laughs> Boom. Yes. Just with better dialogue. But, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so what are some of the pitfalls, uh, that you should avoid when shooting 360 video? So with 360 video, I think one of the biggest complications, one of the newest thing or not complications, but one of the biggest difficulties is um, a lot of creative control is is stripped from the creator. So I think a lot of people go into it expecting to still be able to like frame the shot, if you will. Um, it's 360. With, How can you frame right, a shot? Exactly. So that's kind of a new frustrating thing. And I even remember going out and doing, you know, uh, like previs or, you know, tech scouts, location scouts for different shoots um, and think, and it's kind of weird because you stand there and you're like, Oh, that's a nice angle. That's a nice frame. Oh wait, I can't actually have an angle. Um, you know, this isn't a 2d thing, a box where I'm saying, okay, here are the edges of the frame. You know, there's no lenses that I choose to shoot with. I can't, you know, really change a lot of those things. All I can really choose is where the person is standing and how tall they are. So, um, obviously there's still a lot of cool things you can do with that with movement and drones or whatever you can come up with. Um, but that's kind of the first hurdle that a lot of people have to get over is, is understanding that, 
when you're framing a shot in quotes, um, <laughs> you've got to basically stand in one place and kind of look in every single direction and say, is this interesting over here? Is this interesting over there? And then you've also got to say, well, maybe I don't want it to be interesting other than this one little place. I want the, I want to draw attention to that one part of the 360 degree space. So there's a lot of new questions to ask yourself. Um, and that's kind of one of the bigger uh, you know, artistic hurdles to overcome. There's plenty of technological and other ones we can get into, but, um, that was one of the bigger ones that I remember going through as a creator, you know, coming from the two dimensional world of filmmaking. Uh, it was kind of interesting to be like, wow, this is a totally new way of thinking and a totally new way of storytelling. Now I saw, I was, I was watching your demo on your website and I saw you in the corner. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, right. which brings me to my next question: How do you hide or remove gear, crew, camera operators, etc.? Right. That's a that's a great question. That's actually something I go into a lot in uh, you know in the things I teach in the course. But um, basically, you have to you know make a decision whether or not you can even remove yourself. Like I, I was filming at that uh, Holy Color Festival. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was practically impossible. I mean, I could have tried to paint myself out. Um, but basically the short answer is it's, it's simple techniques like that you've learned in Photoshop or after effects where you're compositing out, um, different things in a 2d, in a 2d space, like on a 2d shot, but with 360 video, obviously it's, you know, how many, how many ever more times work, uh, to make sure everything gets painted out in that 360 space. So there's a few plugins like uh, skybox metal, um, the, or metals skybox, uh, suite is really awesome. That's the one I use. Um, I also use a mixture of like Mocha pro and Mocha VR with, uh, you know, uh, premiere and after effects to, um, and I've, and I have a little bit of background in visual effects, not tons, but I, I had enough that I could figure out, um, basically how to convert this weird sphere video, this equi rectangular, what they call it video, mm -hmm. um, into something that I could work with, uh, as a VFX artist. Um, but it's basically the same techniques, you know, as painting out people in two dimensional video, it's just being able to convert that back and distort it properly so that it looks right in, uh, you know, that sphere and that 360 video. So I, I was going through your site and I wanted to ask you, what is Autopano Video Pro? Oh yeah, that's that is my favorite software. Okay. <laughs> it's all, it's basically the stitching software for um it's kind of the first step in the whole process. So once you've shot everything, whether you've got, you know, 10 cameras or, you know, three cameras or whatever, basically you have obviously you have a bunch of SD cards or you have a bunch of different video files, however you get them. And what AutoPan Video does is it basically takes all those videos and it will smartly sync and um, allows you to easily uh, e either buy an audio cue or a visual clap or something. You can sync them all up, and then it basically finds all the all those little intricate points and stitches them all together. So obviously, the idea with 360 video is when you're shooting with 10 cameras, you want to have overlap, uh, right, on mm -hmm. each one of those cameras, so that um, there's a little bit of wiggle room as far as uh, you know how you're stitching and how you're kind of melding them together to make the edges look seamless. Um, and that's kind of what AutoPano Video takes care of. Uh, is it and it gives you a lot of tools to customize and to um, really tweak and make things look just right. Um, and there's also a partner program called AutoPeno Giga that I believe has been around a lot longer than AutoPeno Video. Uh, and AutoPeno Giga is just basically another program that um, has done the still version. So people that did Google Street View or that the you know the really awesome people that would go on and add 360 photos of the Eiffel Tower or something on Google Earth. Um, I remember looking at those even as a kid. Um, they all used programs very similar to AutoPeno Giga. So the AutoPeno Video is basically the same thing, but just for video. So stitching basically, if I'm for layman terms, is basically just because you've overlapping the video, all the video frames of all the all the cameras you're using in the in the rig, uh, they overlap. So you got to kind of have to melt them together or composite yep. them together in some way. And stitching is the term you use, and that's what basically stitching is. An auto pano video kind of does helps you tremendously by doing that. Yes, yes, that is exactly right. So there's a, you can there's a, I know a few people that uh, not a few people, but there's there's people that I've heard do their stitching in programs like uh, Fusion, you mm -hmm. know, from Black Magic, or they use Nuke and stuff. And that's there's a, there's plenty of uh, you know there's always a million ways to skin a cat um, as far as the post production goes. Um, but the one I really like to use that makes it uh, pretty simple and gives you still you know power user customization options is Auto Pen Video. Yeah. Now is there? But I saw some and at again at the Cinegear I saw some. Um, setups that were doing autos, auto stitching. Like it was, yeah, it was yeah. automatically just doing it for you. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
yeah, they've got, I mean, the Nokia Ozo has proprietary software. Um, I believe the Jaunt uh, actually is entirely cloud-based. So when you go out and shoot with the Jaunt camera, you just upload your media to the cloud and they do all the processing and stitching for you. Um, Stop it. Yeah. So it's pretty, <laughs> it's, it's pretty efficient. Obviously it's like, you know, that's, I, and I'm sure you pay for it on, on the back end, but oh, I'm um, sure <laughs> right. It, it's, it's really awesome. Um, the, the only downside I think to those kinds of solutions, uh, and this isn't really a downside, but you do need to go in and add, you know, finishing touches. So if there are minor stitch problems, obviously the human eye can notice weird aberrations a lot easier and more efficiently than like a computer could. But that said, I think it won't be, you know, another two or three years before computer stitching is completely awesome. You know, Google's got a, uh, the Google jump program. Uh, they're working with all sorts of they're they haven't opened up their API yet, but they're working with all sorts of camera companies. Um, and they've got some really, really awesome, like AI driven stitching. Um, and Facebook even has some stitching, uh, solutions as well. So I think that's kind of the Holy grail right now is a lot of companies are looking for, uh, you know, a seamless, a perfect hundred percent awesome, stitching solutions so that filmmakers no longer have to worry about all that, you know, technical stitching and stuff like that. Um, but when you do want to fix minor issues or polish things off and make things look a little bit better or add little embellishments here and there, um, you still do need to work in that echo rectangular format. So, but yeah, that stitching, hopefully eventually I'm very sure will be automated soon. Now, uh, are there any tips that you can give, uh, the listeners to do a perfect stitch? That's yeah, that's a, (laughs) just a a couple tips. Yeah, a couple tips. Uh, so I think with stitching, the big thing is just being detail oriented. Um, I, I think a lot of people either try to uh, just run through it quickly, and uh, you know they don't want to really spend time looking through each possible angle of their shot. Um, and uh, you know the best way to do that is just to go through and watch it over and over again, and and look up stuff and make sure that uh, it looks good. Sorry, did you hear that? Sorry. No, no, but go keep going. Keep okay, going. <laughs> there's a little notification that came up. That's all uh, good. But, uh, so yeah, I mean, detail oriented, I think is important being able to walk, watch through your shot and notice things. Cause the, the biggest draw, I think, uh, or the biggest important thing with stitching for me is as soon as somebody notices an obvious stitch error, it kind of pulls them out of the magic, yeah. um, as a viewer. And obviously you don't need to be, you don't need to pull your hair out about it and, you know, spend thousands of hours like, making everything look flawless. Uh, but I, I think that's the biggest thing is to realize how important a good stitch is. Um, and then I think the other thing is, is to just, identify, um, and be smart about your shooting. Uh, that's uh, honestly the, the best advice I can give anybody is the magic really doesn't happen in post-production as much as it happens in actually production and shooting. So if you shoot smart and you understand the limitations and the possibilities of your camera, then, you know, you're going to avoid a lot of headaches in post-production. Now, did you, uh, I'm assuming you saw Justin Lin's, uh, short film help. Yes, awesome. <laughs> the three that's a three sixty uh, short film. So that's a really good uh, example of uh, a narrative story. Yeah, yeah, it's great. I mean, they shot that on Reds, so they got a bunch. They got a yeah. Huge yeah, it was you, when, when you got that when you got that kind of when you got Justin Lin money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think it was Google who paid for it. So right, right. Oh yeah, I mean, it was a huge, huge undertaking. Um, but yeah, that was a that that was also a really good example of kind of the mixed media, if you will, of, you know, the, the, the real life captured footage from the reds and the, that 360 rig that they built, but then also adding in three dimensional elements um, that hid a lot, I'm sure of those, you know, any stitching problems they had, they could, you know, kind of paint out or they could hide behind a monster or whatever. Um, so that's actually what a lot of people are moving towards. Um, a lot of filmmakers that I've seen, they're actually shooting a lot of just kind of base plates on in actual 360. And then they actually go in and shoot a lot of the assets and all the, you know, the characters and things that are happening in the frame on like a green screen, just in a, you know, normal studio. And then they composite those in, into that 360 space. Um, so there's really a lot of ways you can do this. Um, and a lot of people are, you know, experimenting with all sorts of different ways. So it's really exciting. So what programs do you use to edit 360 video? Uh, I just use Adobe Premiere, so it's it's basically the exact same thing. You're editing exactly how you would normally, um, mm-hmm. you know, with 2D stuff. Uh, Premiere has just recently, at you know, upgraded and added a kind of a 360 view button, like a toggle you can choose on the program monitor, which is really handy. So you mostly can just it look you can edit in that echo rectangular video format is what they call it, where it looks like it's just really wide angle. It looks kind of weird, um, but then you can click a little button and you can actually you know hit play on your 
your keyboard and, and actually watch in real time uh, what your viewer would be seeing or what they could be seeing. Um, so Premiere has been really good at adopting the technology as well. But uh, luckily, it's exactly the same as uh, as you know editing 2D video. And then and for visual effects, any of the standard visual effects uh, packages would work. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of another difficult thing when, when you're wrapping 360 video in that sphere, uh, from the echo rectangular format, a lot of like blur effects or pixelate or, you know, whatever effects you might have added initially, even color correction sometimes can be a little difficult because at the very end at the 180 degree mark line right behind the viewer, sometimes you'll get a hard line because the effect doesn't know how to basically repeat infinitely in that sphere. Mm -hmm. So it, it actually has to sort of recalculate things And skybox or metal the company has has been doing a really good job at coming out with transitions coming out with effects like uh you know blur and sharpen and things like that basic stuff right now but i'm sure it'll get more advanced uh you know in the near future um they're coming out with those effects that are actually 360 ready so it, right now it's kind of a lot of experimentation to see if it'll work and most of the time they do um but as far as uh you know actually having 360 degree or vr ready effects um i think that's still something that needs to be worked on and a lot of companies i'm sure are are doing that now so now how do you deliver your final product what like what format do you deliver it on so the format is still the same. It's just a QuickTime video. Um, but with Premiere, what uh, what you do when you actually export, there's there used to not be this. Actually, before Premiere updated, there was a little program you had to download from YouTube that uh, uploaded metadata into this video file. However, you know you export it, whether it be an MP4 or, or an MOV, um, and then that that metadata basically told whichever player you uploaded it to that it was a 360 video and that it needed to be treated differently, right? So the big issue with the delivering 360 video right now is you need to be able to deliver it um, on a platform that can actually view 360 video. Because if you just play it on, you know, without that metadata on like a TV or anything, mm -hmm. it'll just play back, you know, at that weird stretched out format, which mm -hmm. is not what you want, obviously. So when you when you're working with clients, um, the you know Premiere has updated their thing where you just click a little box that says this is VR video or this is 360 video, and uh, it'll actually automatically upload that metadata into the video file, and then you just deliver the video file um, as if you were sending any other 2D video. Um, and then obviously you just need to make sure that you're either watching it on you know a headset or if you know they're wanting to do like web distribution, you need to use a program or use like YouTube or Facebook or something like Wistia or Vimeo even has 360 video uh, mm. now. So I'm sure it'll become more, you know, affluent in the future. Um, but yeah, you just need to make sure that they understand that you can't just watch it absolutely anywhere. You need to upload it to a, a program that can, or a, uh, like YouTube or a service that can actually support playing back uh, 360 video. So with all this said, after all the stuff we've talked about, it's fair, it's fair to say that this is not, <clears throat> this is a, you need to know your stuff. To kind of yeah, shoot yeah. this. It's not like grabbing a camera and going out and, you know, shooting. Like you really need to understand the technology. You really need to understand the workflow, the post workflow, which is a lot more complicated than right. just shooting right. a narrative on a 2D situation. Right. Is yeah, that, I mean, it's it's definitely. Um, I mean, there there's some simplicity and stuff, and I've been in it for a long time, so it's probably hard for me to to you know really step back and see. Um, but I remember starting out uh, how complex it was, and you know, it, it, basically having to experiment a lot, a lot of hair pulling, a lot of getting super mad <laughs> trying to figure out how <laughs> stuff worked, uh, wanting to punch the computer and stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's honestly, once you understand the big picture, uh, it, it makes the whole process a lot smoother. So I think that's probably one of the big frustrating things is people try to jump into it without really understanding the end and the beginning and the middle and how, like you said, how the workflow goes. Um, so it, it's still very complicated. Um, there are – it's not as complicated as I think um, people I, – I definitely don't want to scare anybody away. Um, that's kind of my goal uh, with you know what I've been doing. Um, I, I definitely want people to come and be creators in it and I think that was a pleasant surprise that I had too. Is like, OK, this is complex. This is hard. There's things to learn. Um, but, you know, it's doable. Even a, a dumb guy like me can figure it out and, uh, you know, and learn how to do all this stuff and have fun doing it. So it, it's kind of that blend where, yeah, you know, people can save themselves a lot of headache if they do a little bit of homework at the beginning. Um, but yeah, I mean, if they wanted to jump in, they could, if they have, you know, hundred, hundreds of hours of free time and, uh, you know, <laughs> the obviously <laughs> not use Google and stuff, you're like, sure, go ahead. There's, there's plenty of 
you know, random places all over the internet to learn how to do it. Um, just like anything, I guess. Right. But, but you've um, been, so you've been doing this for a while. So you've seen the technology change dramatically in the course right. of, of the time that you've been in it. So it's getting easier. Things that used to take you hours to do now you could do in minutes purely because oh, yeah, of technology. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, and honestly, I haven't even been in it as long as some people have. And even the past few years that I've been doing it, it's, yeah, it's, attention it's getting from big companies is I think the best is the best news that we could be having right now because all that money and research is now going into it and companies are coming out with really awesome technology that helps, you know, obviously with the stitching, that's the biggest thing right now um, that I think people are going to be trying to simplify. Uh, and then obviously as well, um, shooting um, with, with 360 is going to become better and better as well. Cause you look at, uh, like the Nokia Ozo and that camera is professional. It's great, but it's also, it weighs a bunch, you know, it weighs like 20 pounds and, mm-hmm. uh, it's very difficult to work with as far as like a documentary filmmaker that just wants to go out and shoot. Right. Um, it is battery powered, but it's like, you need so much gear. Um, and you kind of look at, uh, the evolution of the DSLR, right. Mm-hmm. Um, where that sort of blew up, you know, the idea that indie filmmakers, uh, can go out and just make a, make a movie, right? They could go out. Don't they get me started. Is like backpack oh, of stuff. Don't, yeah. don't get me started. Please <laughs> right. don't get me started oh, no. <laughs> with the right. DSLRs. Sure <laughs> there's definitely the downside, right? <laughs> I mean, um, oh, yeah. God. I, I, I hope that with 360 video, the technology gets to the place where um, it's simpler. And obviously it will be. I mean, in the future it will be. But uh, yeah, as of right now, it's it's still pretty hard to do, complex. It's, you know, it takes a little bit of expertise, um, but it's also something that, uh, if, if somebody really wants to do, they, they should, and they can. So now, I, I mean, I would equate 360 video a little bit with the 3d, uh, resurgence back in the 2009, 2010, yeah. 11, where 3d was all the rage and everything was going to be shot in 3d and everybody was running <laughs> around trying to get the rigs together. And, oh yep. my God, I need my software. I can't edit 3d. I need, I can't color grade 3d and all of this stuff. <laughs> And I remember all that. I was I was sitting in 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 in, in presentations and in rental houses, and they were all trying to sell their their new 3D rig. And James Cameron was coming out, and the only 3D I've ever seen that I liked was Avatar. Right. Was, <laughs> on Hugo, Hugo was really good too, because because you had two masters working in the format. Right, but, right. But but I think that's a lot. A little bit of that's happening with 360. But unlike 3D, in my personal opinion, I think 360 has a f- much brighter future. I think it's something yeah. that will be around for many, many years to come and will evolve into something that will eventually turn into the holodeck. Right, right. And that, yeah, that's that was honestly the first thing I remember getting into 360 and I was working with – I work at a place called The Good Line. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of like my full-time gig. Uh, and uh, you know, my bosses, my colleagues were talking to me about 360 video a few years back. And that was kind of the first thing we thought is like, okay, is this just another smell-o-vision? Is this a you – know, <laughs> Right. I mean, is it just another gimmick? And we kind of started thinking it was at first, but yeah, like you say, once I think everybody started catching on to the marketing possibilities, the education possibilities, um, the entertainment possibility, like it really just fits all these different, uh, you know, needs that a lot of companies and medical services have. Oh, medical. Yeah. You name it. It's, you know, even, yeah, all sorts of ways to train people. I I've seen really cool studies done with, um, people that are, you know, in end of life care, elderly folks that are going through a lot of pain or Alzheimer's and they actually give them, uh, 360 goggles or VR goggles to like sit at a beach or to go on a walk. Mm -hmm. And they actually have shown, you know, through MRIs and stuff that, uh, it's helping with their, you know, depression, their anxiety, of course, um, you know, pain. So it's, it's awesome. It's, I mean, it has also, it, it, really goes across the whole spectrum of how it can help people. It is, um, it is but, turning into like total recall and all these old sci-fi oh, movies. Yeah. It really is like, right, right. what was that? The sixth day. I remember where Michael Rappaport, uh, an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie called the sixth day at six. Oh, I think yeah, it was called yeah. the sixth day. And, and you know, he had a, a three dimensional, you know, girlfriend, you know, and all okay, and like, yeah. but I'm not saying that this is turning into that, but I'm like, wow, it's, it's get, we're all getting to that place where you can sit on oh, a beach oh. and I can be in Hawaii I can have the sound and I can have the stim- – I can't feel the right. heat of the sun, but I can s- almost smell it and see. Oh, they're getting there. I'm sure they're going to – I mean they even have – they're doing research now where you put on gloves and it actually will give you tactile feedback. So you can touch things and feel like fur. You can feel Jesus. you know, glass. You can. I mean it, it's getting scary. <laughs> it's the Matrix. I mean, We're, getting the have... Matrix. We're getting into the Matrix. We're getting into the Matrix. Oh, it totally is. <laughs> I mean there might even be people in – I think it's you know, Inception where people are dreaming and they pay to they go to these little underground places just to stay in their dreams because they like it better than real life. And – 
I honestly would not uh, think that that's too far off. Um, You know, eventually we're going to get to that point where, yeah, it's wild. I mean, people are even using it for, uh, I even heard of a dentist that was using it and is not needing to use painkiller at all when he's doing fillings or root canals because people are so into the VR experience. I mean, they just use VR goggles instead of painkiller. It's wild. <laughs> so it's awesome. Yeah, it's crazy. And and I think the exciting thing that um, I remember seeing at NAB just this last time is that we are actually very, very close to actually getting VR video. So um, as I explained before, VR is when you can walk around in a space and look around objects oh, and stuff. It's not just shit. looking where you're at. They're actually coming up with cameras like the Lytro and other cameras that, that are basically light field capture. So it's more than just capturing you know, the brightness of the reflection of light like a normal camera does or the color of whatever the reflection is. It's actually capturing depth information. Um, and it will be able to 3D scan an environment in Jesus. real time. And then you can literally walk around you know, at a sporting event or – um, I mean, it'll take virtual, uh, uh, field trips to the next level. Cause you can go up and, and who knows, maybe you can go touch rocks and you can, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, the, the sky's the limit really, um, on, on how this technology will develop. So that, and, and that's kind of where I think we saw too, kind of coming back to your original question that it's, it's definitely more than a gimmick. I think at this point, because I think yeah. people are realizing this is kind of the future of how we present information to people remotely. I mean, it will make the world that much smaller. Uh, you can go swimming in the the ocean, and then the next second you can be walking on Mars from 3D scans from the rover. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think I think at this point for filmmakers, it's I I don't I don't see it how it can turn into something for narrative filmmaking per mm-hmm. se. Yeah. Like I saw the Justin Lin thing, and that's great, and it's awesome, but that's not a right. film. That's an experience. It's a. It's like totally. almost a. It's almost like a ride. It's almost like a, 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 a not carnival ride, but like you know some sort of Disney or Universal ride where you kind of experience something. Absolutely, it's different than filmmaking. It's different than television or movies or anything like that. It's right because that for, that that um, that medium is about a creator, director uh, telling you, "I need you to look at this now. I need you to look at that now." Totally. Now, so you can't get that with 360, but with three, but the other things that are available, what you can do with it is massive. So can you real quickly uh, tell the audience a few places like, if hey, I'm going to get into the 360 world now. I'm a filmmaker. Where can I make some money? <laughs> that's that's a great question. Yeah. Um, honestly, the biggest place right now, I think, is education. That is the biggest market right now um, to get involved with. So, uh, there's a lot of schools all over the country, all over the world, um, whether that be high schools or, you know, universities obviously usually have a little bit bigger budgets. Um, they're all looking for, you know, everything from consultants to actual practitioners, um, which is what I'm doing with the university here in Utah. Um, where uh, they're wanting to create this 360 content um, and they're wanting to make it interactive and interesting and, and, and fun. So there's a huge, huge market in, in education. And I would think the next one, real estate is obviously a big one um, because people, you know, real estate agents are also always looking for, um, you know, ways to sell homes uh, Mm -hmm. innovatively and better. Um, There's other cameras like the Matterport that do the photo still virtual tours. Those are cool. Um, But I think 360 video has a space there. Um, But um, yeah, yeah, I mean, education and and real estate, I think, are kind of the biggest low hanging fruit right now. Um, as far as like actually doing branding and marketing, I think that's also another big area. That's kind of what where I've been, you know, in my wheelhouse for the past while. Like I was out in the Philippines directing a video um, showcasing a factory sewer for a company named Code Epoxy, uh, where we followed uh, a sewer in one of their factories, kind of in a day in a day in the life, kind of with his really adorable family and mm-hmm. his home and everything. Um, so I think there's a lot of companies that are wanting to do that as well. You, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, like liquor companies or um, you know companies that want to show, okay, this is how this product is made. The this factory is our origin, sure. right? They want to see the 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 people working with their hands and stuff. So I think there's a lot of marketing and brand work um, that will be coming out soon as well. Um, and I think, uh, like, I, I actually I tend to agree with you that narrative filmmaking um, is cool with 360, but like you say, it's more of an experience. And I think um, documentary filmmaking can still have a place with 360, and I think it still will. Um, I don't know if it's, st- if it's still called a documentary you know, film. It's definitely different because, like you say, you're not really directing where people are looking. Yeah, but like, um, plan- but like Planet Earth. 
or, oh, yeah. Yeah. or or National Geographic, any kind of wildlife documentary. Right. I mean, it's right. built for that kind of stuff. But like, totally. you're going to see, you know, um, Fahrenheit 9/11 <laughs> in 360. <Right. laughs> d- d- don't really think so. You know, Bowling for Columbine, not really the 360 kind right. of movie. Right. Um, but I think for for those kind of documentaries, uh, those the, anything nature based. Is uh, you know, yeah. or, or anything that you like? I'm gonna go see how how you know olive oil is made, for lack of a better term. And I'm gonna go to right. the, or wine, and I'm gonna go to the winery, and you walk through the thing. But it's an experience. Yeah, yeah. It's different. It's it's not narr- It is kind of narrative, but it's different. Right. So I think oh, we're still totally in the, we're yeah. st- we're still in the infancy, basically, of this oh, whole. Absolutely, I think people are still filling out. You know where it's it's used well for. You know why why we should use it over another tool. Um, and I and I guess it comes back to that foundation. It's something that I've always tried to work, you know, live by in my career is that you know story is king. Uh, you know your content is what matters. It doesn't matter if you're shooting with you know fancy camera or not fancy camera. Obviously, tools are important. You want to have as good a gear as you can. Um, but 360 video, VR, that kind of thing is just another tool in the toolbox, right? So if you've got a story or an experience or a, a message or anything that you're wanting to share with somebody, um, you know, you should always still consider 360 as a possibility. But also, I think people should avoid and try to avoid the pitfall of shooting a 360 just because it's cool. Um, you know, there, you see a lot of stuff yeah. where even commercials and stuff, I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like, it's cool 360, but I I don't know why they decided to shoot it in 360 other than just to have <laughs> 360 in the metadata, right? Right. Um, right so right. I, I think it's another tool in the toolkit and, uh, and and people should should respect it obviously and understand its power and you know how it can be used, but also avoid using it just for the sake of using it. Now, can you tell us a little bit about your awesome course on 360? Because I know you have a course telling yeah. us how to master this technology, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, it, I appreciate that. It's it's a it's been a fun you know project, passion, a project of love basically. Um, I put a lot of t- a lot of time into it. Basically, it's the problem that I wanted to solve. Where um, I you know if you don't want to spend hours on Google, if you don't want to you know watch random tutorial videos, and there's a lot of great stuff out there. I I'm not, I don't mean to bash anything, um, but I I kind of just wanted to put everything in one place. Um, and I kind of OCD about that, so I had a lot of fun organizing it and getting figuring out the process and the workflow. Um, and I wanted to put it all into one place where people can learn the A to Z, right? So pre-production, everything from pre-production all the way to delivery. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, while I'm talking about this as well, I'm, I'm also continually adding to the course. Um, and I do kind of these virtual job shadows, if you will, where, um, I'll be editing and putting together videos of me actually out working. Um, I've got, uh, that, um, geology shoot here coming up in a few weeks and I've got, you know, whole crew ready to go out and we're going to go shoot, uh, the video obviously, but I'm also going to be doing education and teaching while I'm doing the project. So I'll be talking to the camera, explaining why I'm doing certain things. Um, so people can, you know, kind of come along and see how I work and see, you know, the choices that I'm making and how I'm making them, why I'm making them. Um, so it's a really cool course. Um, it's a place it's, it's kind of a community as well that I'd like to build where, you know, serious 360 filmmakers are wanting to come for feedback. They're wanting to be able to learn new things and kind of come to a place that's continually updating with, you know, the latest and greatest information. Um, and you know, that's kind of why I did it. Cause I, I love 360 video. I'm passionate about it. And, uh, you know, I feel like, you know, people need to come together and learn together. And I, I think it could be a really cool place. Yeah, and, and, uh, and the hustlers, the tribe, uh, Josh has given us a cool discount on the course and I'll leave that in the show notes. And I'll talk a little bit about that after we're done with this interview, but I'll give you all of that uh, cool information. So now, Josh, I have a, a few questions I always ask all of our, our, our guests. So please prepare yourself for the Oprah questions. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> First and foremost, what advice would you give a filmmaker who's just wanted to jump into the 360 realm? Wow. That, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, the best advice I can give is to to worry more about creating and getting stuff made than a what people are going to think about it and to or and b how you're going to market it. I think that's. Uh, one of the biggest downsides I see about people starting out is they're worried so much about their keywords. They're worried about their SEO. They're worried about, you know, all the technicalities of it, but they're not stressing as much on the actual creating and making and going out and making mistakes and, and, uh, you know, having fun and enjoying the process. So that's what I would say, go out and make and worry later about how to get, um, you know, the clients or get, you know, the views or whatever. I I think the, the important part is going out and creating and going through that process. Um, now 
What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Oh, man. That is a good question. I told you. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's deep. Okay. Uh, I would say – Gosh, I still even struggle with it, I think, but um, I think I'm, I'm getting a little bit better at not worrying about what other people think about my work. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously you need to make money. You need to, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it, your work needs to, to be what other people want a lot of the time. But I've learned that um, the reason anybody gets into filmmaking or, you know, any kind of art, I think for that matter, is to obviously... I mean, it's fulfilling to you, right? For, for to making it for whatever it's worth, and mm-hmm. uh, sometimes people don't like it. Sometimes people do. Um, I think the biggest thing for you know is to go through that world and take note of feedback, take note of uh, constructive criticism, but also don't take it too personally, you know, and uh, don't let it affect your work. Don't let it uh, discourage you from moving on. Um, you know, if if you have to make stuff that people hate for a few years, you know, that's part of the process and go through that and make it and then you'll learn and grow and eventually you'll be making stuff that everybody wants to see. And, um, I, yeah, I think that was, that was kind of a a lesson that, you know, I'm still learning even where you just want to learn how to, I guess, have thick skin in a way, right? You you definitely need that in this business (laughs) in any three, in any, in 180, in 360, in 90, (laughs) in all degrees, you need thick skin. (laughs) That's true. So, um, so name three of your favorite films of all time. Oh, gosh. It won't be on your gravestone. Just three that come to your mind. <laughs> three that come to my mind. Um, let's see. Gosh. So I always answer this. I, I probably will get judged by all my, you know, film school, uh, you know, nerd cinephiles, but Tommy boy. Yes. Um, <laughs> Yes. It's kind of a, a shameless plug. I mean, I, I, no, I dude, dude, love it's, that movie. It's, I mean, come on. It's Chris Farley. It's, it's cool. It's classic. It's got everything you need. You know, the, the <laughs> laughing, the crying. Um, it's totally one of those movies for me. Okay. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, yeah I, I know. I know. When, um, you ever, when you ever do these lists, they're like, so Akira Kurosawa and Bergman. Like, no, man, Tommy Boy. I like oh, I know, right? <laughs> Tommy Boy. Yeah, I mean, I could get into the film school. Stuff sure, too. of course, of That's course. That's boring, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. So Tommy Boy. Okay. <laughs> um, the one of the more recent ones that I saw that I absolutely loved was Logan. Um, oh I don't know if you've seen God, that yet. Oh my God, it's so amazing. Loved it. It's so it's, so good. It's a the world was, It's a spiritual oh, yeah. experience. Oh, absolutely. I, I was blown away with how. Um, down to earth a superhero movie could be. Uh, and that's what I was really impressed with. It had all that superhero action, but it just felt so raw and gritty and it was great. So that was one I really loved too. Um, and then let's go into the documentary world. I think one that I saw at Sundance a couple years back uh, called Pervert Park. I don't know if you've seen that. Mm, I have not. It's uh, it's basically about a an RV park where a bunch of you know perverts, basically sex, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sexual deviants. I guess you could say okay. people have been convicted of you know all sorts of terrible things. They basically can't find living anywhere else other than this RV park. So there's a bunch of pedophiles, you know, rapists, terrible. Oh Jesus! You know, things that have happened at, at this one place. Um, but it's interesting because it kind of takes you into their world a little bit and it interviews with them, talks with them about you know how what their history is, how you know, whatever happened, happened. Um, so it's kind of a, it, it definitely doesn't give, you know, like an okay to what they did, but it, it definitely humanizes it a little bit. Um, and it kind of opened my eyes, um, to that, that world. And, uh, so if anybody's looking for a nice, uh, depressing, <laughs> really <laughs> serious documentary, go ahead and go watch pervert park, but it's, it's really well made. Um, really fantastic documentary filmmaking if you ask me. So, and then also after that, just watch Tommy boy and you'll be fine. Yes, and then watch Tommy Boy. <laughs> oh, yeah, Tommy Boy's the best. So, Josh, where can people find you? So, I'm on pretty much any social media platform. Uh, my, uh, yeah, Of course, you can find me at the the website, um, the course website. You can even chat with me at any time down at the bottom right there if you'd like. Um, I'm on Twitter at Josh L. Gibson. Uh, yeah, Facebook. I mean, you just search for me. My, my website is... Uh, Josh Gibson dot me as mm-hmm. well. So if you just want to go there, you can find, I think it's at the bottom left. There's all my social media icons and stuff. So if anybody feel free to reach out, anyway. if anybody needs a good 360 guide, uh, give Josh a call. Uh, he'll help Definitely. you out. So uh, Josh, man, thank you so much for answering all of our questions, man. I really, pre- I really appreciate it. No, I, it's, it's my pleasure. I'm very, was very happy to come on and it was, it was a great time. Well, if you didn't know anything about 
360 video before, you definitely know something about it now. Uh, Josh was uh, amazing, and thank you, Josh, so much for dropping some major knowledge bombs on us about shooting 360. It's, I, I think, guys, it, it's honestly a, a a really interesting tool to tell stories in a unique way. I don't think, again, like I said before, it's going to replace uh, cinema as we know it, but it is definitely not a fad like smell vision or something like that. I do think it's going to be around for a while, and there is some definitely some potential for filmmakers to go out there and make a living, make money, uh, do projects with it. So definitely check it out. And if you actually want to take uh, Josh's course, which is uh, the 360 Academy, Josh usually sells that course for $789, which honestly is a bargain based on what uh, you're going to be getting out of if you're getting into the 360 world. But with the coupon code HUSTLE, you get $679 or $689 off. So the course turns into $100. So that's a hell of a gift for all of the Indie Film Hustle tribe looking to get into 360 video. So just go to www.360videoacademy.com and type in the coupon code HUSTLE to get $689 off the course. Again, if you guys are really interested in 360 video, uh, Josh's course is really great. I did take it. It's pretty awesome, to tell you the truth, and I learned a lot. So if you're into 360 video, definitely check it out. I'll put a link and for everything we talked about in the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 157. And guys, if you like the show, please head over to FilmmakingPodcast.com and leave an honest review on iTunes. It helps out a lot. It really does help me out a lot. Helps the show get out there to more and more filmmakers. So please head over to filmmakingpodcast.com and leave a hopefully good review. Until next time, keep that hustle going, keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.